A refined blonde actress from Philadelphia becomes a star, with Hollywood and the whole world at her feet. But she discovers that despite fame and success, she is still lonely. One day, in southern France, she meets, by chance, a shy but charismatic prince, monarch of a state so small, few could place it on a map. Suddenly, she has to decide between a career she adores and giving up everything she has ever known for love. Welcome to True Love Podcast, where we dive into the real story behind the fairy tale of the most famous couples in history. For more information and bibliography, go to truelovepod.com. On Pinterest, at True Love Pod, you will find many images of the couples discussed in the episode. And now, let's discover the truth behind the fairy tale of Grace Kelly and Rainier III of Monaco. On the morning of May the 6th, 1955, in southern France, Grace Kelly was in a hurry. She had a busy day ahead, full of professional engagements for the Cannes Film Festival. The actress had agreed to a photo shoot for the French magazine Paris Match with Prince Rainier III of Monaco in his pink palace in the early afternoon, but she was already regretting it. Monaco is at least one hour away from Cannes, and that's without traffic. There wouldn't be much time left after the photo op for Grace to change into something more movie star appropriate before the official festival screening of The Country Girl, the film that had just won Grace an Oscar. After the screening, she would host a dinner for a few intimates, and after that there would be the party organized by Paramount Pictures, the studio that produced The Country Girl. Kelly also would have liked to spend more time with the fascinating French actor Jean-Pierre Aumont, an old friend she had invited to Cannes. Grace was still pondering if she could come up with an excuse to skip the meeting with Renier while she washed her hair. She plugged in the hair dryer and nothing happened. Due to a strike, there was no electricity for drying her hair and no electricity to iron the pastel color dress she had chosen to wear. The actress had to improvise a chignon and hoped that it would be dry by the time they arrived in Monaco. As for which dress to wear, Grace had to choose the dress with the least wrinkles, and unfortunately that was the dress that she and her friends jokingly referred to as the dreaded taffeta dress because the color and the shape she thought weren't to her best advantage. When you see it in person, it's actually a lovely 1950 confection in black taffeta with big pink, yellow and white flowers, a tight bodice and a full skirt. But when she met the journalist from Paris Match in the lobby, she discovered that in order to meet the prince, she had to wear a hat since she was meeting a head of state. Grace hadn't brought one with her to France, and it was impossible to buy one as the shops were closed for their lunch break. So, back in her room, she cobbled up a fake flower headband that could pass as a hat. Finally, Kelly climbed into the car with the reporters, and off they went at top speed to make it to Monaco in time for their three o'clock appointment with the prince. They arrived with minutes to spare, only to discover that Rainier was not there. An ebb of the monarch showed them around the most magnificent among the 220 rooms of the Monegasque Pink Stone Palace. It's a 13th century building that has been the home of the Grimaldi family for 800 years. Grace stopped to dutifully pose for pictures. 45 minutes passed, and she was incensed at the rudeness of her host and ready to get back to Cannes and to her busy schedule, when, finally, Rainier made his entrance. 
Dressed in a brown sports suit with sunglasses covering his deep blue eyes, Rainier, at 32, was the absolute ruler of the tiny principality. Shy, reserved, moody, not particularly tall and not particularly handsome, the Grimaldi hair could be incredibly engaging and funny in one-in-one conversation. In his British-accented English, the prince offered Grace a tour of the palace, but she pointed out that they already had one while they were waiting for him. So Rainier proposed to visit his zoo and the gardens. Grace had always loved flowers, so she happily agreed. The brief awkwardness of posing for photos as perfect strangers was soon overcome as they strolled through the grounds of the palace, the retinue keeping a little distance to give them some privacy to talk. The monarch had little interest in flowers, but was very proud of his newly created little zoo with two lions, various monkeys and a tiger. While showing Grace the animals, the prince nonchalantly put his arm through the bars of the cage to stroke his tiger, as if it were no more than a kitten. Kelly was impressed, and even from the pictures you can see her, unease to be so close to a wild animal, even if caged. After the tour, Rainier offered the actress and the reporters to stay for a refreshment, but Kelly had to go back to Cannes to fulfill her many commitments. They said their goodbyes, then Grace and the reporters left. To those who asked how Rainier was, she answered that he was charming. In an interview, the prince said Miss Kelly was the first American girl he had ever met, and he was struck by her calm and agreeable demeanor. The press ran wild with the story, and MGM, the studio that had Grace under contract, decided to milk the story by casting the actress in the role of a princess in her next movie. But nothing more was heard about Grace and Rainier, and the speculations quickly died down. That brief encounter seemed to be the start and the end of the relationship. So how did Grace become the Princess of Monaco just a few months later? Well, it's all thanks to a very short thank you note written out of politeness. Politeness had been drilled into Grace since her childhood in Philadelphia. Grace Patricia Kelly was born the 12th of November, 1929, the third child of an athletic and beautifully wholesome family. The Kellys were wealthy, but they were new money and Catholics, so they were not part of the WASP mainline elite. As Mark Twain said, in Boston they ask, how much does he know? In New York, how much is he worth? In Philadelphia, who were his parents? Grace's father was John Brandon Kelly, known as Jack. He was very handsome and charismatic, driven and ambitious, with a flair for business and a passion for sports and politics. Unfortunately, Jack was also very self-centered. He had been born in Philadelphia to Irish immigrants in 1889. He started a construction company at 30 and became a multimillionaire. He also was a very successful athlete in the 1920s, winning three gold medals in rowing at the Olympics. In the 1930s and 1940s, he set his sights on politics, where he had less success being a Democrat in a then-Republican stronghold. Jack was a living myth among family and friends, and he loved it. Grace inherited her handsome blonde looks from her mother, Margaret Catherine Meyer. Makelli, as she became known, was of German descent, and she worked briefly as a magazine cover model before becoming the first director of women's athletics at Penn University. A strict disciplinarian organized 
frugal, industrious, Margaret was the perfect housewife, but showed her children little affection. Jack built for them a spacious Georgian-style house of red bricks in East Falls, a quaint neighborhood of Philadelphia near the Schuylkill River. They had four children. The eldest was Peggy, a vital athletic go-getter, and she was Jack's favorite. Much to Grace's chagrin, since she adored her father, but he never understood her. The second to be born was John Brandon Jr., known as Kel, the only son and heir, molded by his father in his own image and raised to revenge Jack's few failures. The youngest sibling, coming a couple of years after Grace, was Lizanne, the mischievous baby of the family, spoiled by Margaret. Grace was not particularly good at sports and had no interest in competitions. Later remembering the atmosphere at home as we were always competing, competing for everything, competing for love. As a sickly child, eternally prone to colds, little Gracie much preferred to stay inside and read, dream and play act with her dolls. Her mother recounted that her quietness made everyone feel they ought to take care of her. Even I, the mother of four, was more conscious of her wants and needs. The others were so capable and independent that I knew they were sufficient unto themselves. But I always wanted to protect Gracie. At 11, Gracie joined a local drama group and announced she would follow her two paternal uncles in working in show business. Jack's two older brothers were Walter, a vaudevillian, and George, a Pulitzer-winning writer who loved theater and hated Hollywood. Uncle George was the only one in the family who encouraged and nurtured Gracie's love for acting and theater, and she was forever grateful to this kindred soul and always proud of his accomplishments. Grace came into her teens while World War II was raging, and she had been born the year that the Great Depression started, the economic slowdown that gripped the planet in the 1930s. But neither had a significant impact on her family or her life. In her teens, Grace was, according to Ma Kelly, Nothing but a giggly somebody with a high nasal voice. Her enjoyment of food gave her a little extra weight, and like her father, she was nearsighted, which made it necessary for her to wear glasses. All in all, she was nobody's Princess Charming in those days. Ouch! This gives you an idea of the atmosphere Grace was living in while growing up. And it was written in an article to be published on a national level when Grace was the height of her fame. It was at that time that Grace began to participate in amateur theatre plays in Philadelphia and to go out with boys. And her mother in a, a later interview, also said that every last boy and man who ever went out with her fell a little in love with her. Our house was everlasting full of mooning boys. She had the ability to keep quiet and let the men talk, letting them feel they were strong and important and virile. At 15, Grace received her first marriage proposal by a friend of her brother Kel. She refused. It was another friend of Kel who became her first love and her first heartbreak. Harper Davis was described by her mom as a nice, clean-cut boy with brown hair and eyes. He and Gracie made a handsome young couple. But it didn't last possibly because of family opposition. Grace ended the relationship after a few months 
and Harper joined the Navy following his graduation. In 1946, he was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and sent home to die. According to a family friend, Grace spent many hours at his house trying to cheer him up. Then she would go back to her room and cry, but she would speak little of it, even to her family. It was only reading interviews years later that they discover how deep Grace's feelings had been. In June 1947, Grace graduated from high school and applied to Bennington College, a liberal arts university in Vermont. Her mother wanted at least one of her daughters to earn a college degree. Grace wasn't accepted, so she decided to go to New York to study at the American Academy of Dramatic Art, the oldest acting school in the English-speaking world, where Lauren Bacall and Kirk Douglas had studied just a few years before. Grace's parents had many misgivings. Jack knew how difficult life on stage could be through his brothers, while Ma Kelly didn't like the idea of her timid daughter all alone in the big city. Grace persisted. In the end, her parents relented because they didn't think she would ever amount to anything. They imagined that in a few months she would be back home in Philadelphia. As a precaution, Jake and Margaret insisted that Grace live at the Barbizon Hotel for Women, an imposing neo-Gothic landmark a few minutes' walk from Central Park. It housed only girls from good families. Men were not allowed beyond the lobby, there was a curfew, and matrons patrolled corridors. There, Grace became friends with girls who worked as models. Wanting to be independent from her parents and to show them what she was capable of, Grace decided to become a mother herself. She admitted that she didn't like the job and she wasn't very good at it, but soon she could command good wages. Being professional and ambitious, Kelly learned all she could about the, how to be photographed to her best advantage what kind of clothes and hair and makeup suited her best. The actress had arrived in New York as a wavy dark blonde, wearing horn-rimmed glasses, sensible school mom clothes and comfortable shoes. She was a far cry from the elegantly dressed Hollywood star she would become. Later, thanks to the collaboration with incredible designers like Edith Head and Helen Rose. Grace's voice was also very different. At the Academy, she had to work hard to get rid of her Philadelphian accent and high-pitched nasal voice. During her second year of studies, 1949-1949, she started a relationship with one of her teachers, theater director Don Richardson. Like most of her subsequent boyfriends, Don was older, urbane, charming, knowledgeable and passionate about acting, and giving her all the praise and admiration she never received at home. Don was under no illusion Kelly could succeed in theater as her voice was too weak to be heard beyond the first rows. But with her beauty and style, Richardson thought Grace would be a success in Hollywood, so he introduced her to her first agent. The relationship was serious enough that Kelly brought Don home to Philadelphia to meet her family, but the weekend was a disaster, and the romance cooled. The actress might not have approved of her relative's open dislike of her boyfriend, but she didn't object to it and, in the end, submitted to their choice. In 1949, Grace graduated from the Academy and found a few jobs in theatre, but her bread and butter were live television plays. During the summer of 1950, 
Kelly had her very first short part in a movie, The Noir 14 Hours. Nobody noticed. So she went back to New York and back to trying to make it in theater. In the fall of 1951, Grace starred in High Noon, one of the best western ever made. But she felt the only thing she had learned on set was that she was not a good enough actress yet. The producers had chosen her because she was a blonde beauty they could pay little, and the director didn't spend much time mentoring her. He thought that her stiffness and inexperience suited her character. The movie that truly launched Grace was Mogambo. As Kelly recounted, Mogambo had three things that interested me. John Ford, Clark Gable, and a trip to Africa with expenses paid. For these reasons, she accepted to sign in November 1952 a contract with MGM for seven years at $750 per week. That was half the usual pay for beginner actors. But what Grace wanted to negotiate was living in New York and not on the West Coast and to have enough time to pursue her theatrical dreams by doing a maximum of three movies a year and taking every other year off. MGM was surprised at the goal of an unknown starlet making demands to one of the oldest studios, but executives accepted Kelly's requests since working in theater would add prestige to her image. Mogamba was a big Hollywood production typical of the 1950s, with on-location filming in faraway lands and a romantic triangle between the burly Hunter Gable the blonde and prim and in the end dutiful Grace, and the sultry down-to-earth brunette interpreted by Eva Garner. It was a massive hit with the public, well-reviewed by the critics, and was even nominated for two Oscars, Garner for Best Actress and Kelly for Best Supporting Actress. While Eva shines in her role, Again, the director of this movie hadn't made the effort to help Grace grow in her, in her craft, and it shows on screen. There were rumors of an affair between Kelly and Clark Gable during filming. Despite having bad breath and rough manners, the 51-year-old King of Hollywood was still a womanizer who exuded masculinity and charm. The dalliance, if it existed, ended with when the movie wrapped up, and those rumors never became articles in Scandal magazines. That was to change on the 1953 set of Dial M for Murder, where Grace met a director who brought her career to new heights, and a man who nearly destroyed it. Dial M for Murder was the start of a fruitful relationship between brilliant director Alfred Hitchcock and the actress. Hitch was searching for a new muse after Ingrid Bergman left Hollywood. He was the first director who truly believed in Grace's talent. He also respected her ideas and opinions about the movie, which for him was highly unusual. Grace told a friend that it was while working for Hitch that she had discovered what movie making was all about. On set, Kelly also met a swarthy, handsome, older Welsh actor with an Academy Award under his belt. Ray Milland and Grace became smitten with each other to the point that they thought about him leaving his wife so they could get married. But articles started to appear, describing the actors as a homebreaker and worse. Milland and Kelly scared by the impact it could have on their reputation and career, decided to end the, re the relation. This left the door open for a new man in Grace's life, one who fell in love with her just by seeing her on screen. Oleg Alexandrovich Lovieski Cassini was another swarthy, charming, older European gentleman. The slim playboy with a distinctive pencil moustache had two divorces, two daughters, and a passion for tennis, beauty, and fashion. 
a descendant of Russian and Italian nobility, he had grown up in Florence, worked as a designer at Paramount Pictures, before opening his own dress salon in New York in 1952. Oleg promptly became part of the Metropolis elite and famously went on to be Jackie's secretary of style during her White House years. At Mogambo's premiere in New York in the fall of 1953, Cassini saw Kelly on screen and exclaimed, that girl is going to be mine. Imagine the surprise when going to dinner at Le Vaudeur, the city's oldest French bistro, after the premiere, Oleg saw Grace dining there. He boldly introduced himself, despite cl Kelly clearly being on a date. He then proceeded to court her with flowers, phone calls, billets doux, and meals in fancy restaurants, even when she was working in California. The actress enjoyed his courtship and his occasional company, but she was not interested in a relationship. Kelly still had some feelings for Miland, and she was working constantly. Between November and January, Grace starred in one of Hitchcock's best movies, Rear Window. Then, at the beginning of 1954, she had a small role in the Korean war drama The Bridges of Tokori. After that, there was a one role she had deeply desired, because she would need to act without relying on her beauty or on glamorous clothes. In the movie The Country Girl, Kelly portrays Georgie Elkin, the long-suffering wife of Frank, an alcoholic has been actor struggling with the one last chance given to him by director Baron Dodd, who wants him to be the protagonist of his musical. Georgie is torn between loyalty to Frank and the yearning to give up on their marriage like Frank had, had given up on himself. On set, Grace was torn between her two co-stars, Bean Crosby and William Holden. The White Christmas crooner had been a national institution since the 1930s. He had won an Oscar in 1944, and as a widower and a Catholic of Irish descent, he would be an acceptable potential husband. Crosby was head over heels in love with Kelly, but she saw him only as a dear friend. William Holden, on the other hand, was Hollywood's golden boy, a critically acclaimed, incredibly successful and handsome actor. Grace and Bill had a brief entanglement, but it ended after a few weeks. The country girl wrapped up in April and Kelly immediately flew to Columbia for the South American adventure drama Green Fire, a failed attempt by MGM to recreate the success of Mogambo. Green Fire wrapped in May, and the actress immediately flew to France for the final movie she worked on that year, the romantic thriller To Catch a Thief, again under the direction of Alfred Hitchcock. Before leaving for France, Grace sent Oleg Cassini a note. Those who love me, follow me. And he did. In the idyllic atmosphere of southern France, the courtship finally blossomed into something more. She spent her off time with him, exploring picturesque villages up and down the Riviera and sampling the local cuisine in restaurants Cassini discovered. Swept up their, by their mutual attraction and the fairy tale surroundings, Grace and Oleg decided to marry. He was her first openly acknowledged boyfriend, and when the new couple got back to the States in September, the actress decided to introduce Cassini to her parents. It did not go well. The Kellys did not like his divorces nor his fame as a playboy, so they behaved as if he wasn't there. Grace wanted to get married and to have children, but she also wanted someone her family approved of. And she couldn't dismiss Oleg's furious jealousy 
or the fact that the fashion designer, like a cat, seemed to enjoy the hunt more than reaching the prey. The liaison slowly cooled with the advance of fall. Things were not better for Kelly on a professional level. 1954 had been, as Life magazine put it, this year of grace. She had received her first Oscar nomination and all her three movies were among the highest grossing. But MGM kept offering her roles that were all a variation of the beautiful damsel in distress. And the actress kept turning them down, so MGM suspended her. In November 1954, Kelly turned 25. Her little sister Lizanne had married in June and was now pregnant, while she, despite her efforts, was still not working in theatre, still not married, still not a mother, and not even near it. It was hard for Grace to find a husband who would be right for her and for her family. She was working extensively, often traveling, and that didn't leave her much time to meet men outside the set. But her parents had made clear their disdain for her career, as an article McKelly wrote shows. When I thought of her getting married at all, I hope she wouldn't choose someone from her own profession. McKelly adds that I'd hoped she would marry someone of real distinction. In other words, a man who could stand on his own as the head of the family, not one who would go through life being introduced as Grace's husband. And Grace herself echoed that sentiment when she exclaimed that she needed someone with a strong personality to hold his own against the fame of an actress. 1954 ended somberly, but 1955 started on a bright note. At the beginning of the year, MGM suspended the suspension because Kelly had been nominated for Best Actress at the Academy Awards. Fellow nominees were Judy Garland in A Star is Born, a critical and commercial success hailed by Time magazine as the greatest one-woman show in modern movie history. Dorothy Dandridge in Carmen Jones, one of her best roles and the first time an African-American actress was nominated. Jane Wyman in Magnificent Obsession, a heart-wrenching romance everybody wanted to see. And Audrey Hepburn in Sabrina. Although it is one of her best movies, she had already won the year before with Roman Holiday. The competition was so tough that nobody expected Grace to succeed. But when the winner for Best Actress was announced, it was Kelly who rose from her seat, still not quite believing that they had really called her name. She glided on stage to accept a statuette in a stunning aquamarine co column dress with a small train, long white gloves and a couple of small yellow roses she had tucked in her chignon minutes before the ceremony. Kelly had just achieved the highest honor in her field. With her diligence, tenacity and ambition, she had gained worldwide recognition, financial independence, unanimous respect from all who worked with her. And what she felt in that moment at the apex of her profession was dissatisfaction and solitude. Grace recounted that when she got back to her hotel room, it was just the two of us, Oscar and I. It was the loneliest moment of my life. That spring of 1955, the movie star was still without work, so she threw herself in the complete remodeling of her new apartment in a tiny part of New York, when she was invited to the Cannes Film Festival. 
Grace used the occasion to reconnect with the handsome Jean-Pierre Aumont, a renowned French actor, a hero of the Resistance, and a widower with a small child. The two had first met a couple of years prior in New York, while they were working in live television. Kelly had always had a passion for the language and culture of France, saying in an interview, I love France and the way Frenchmen's minds work. During the Cannes Film Festival, Grace and Jean-Pierre openly enjoyed each other's company. They walked hand in hand through the street of an enchanting village. They visited little artisanal shops. They tossed coin in a fountain. They tenderly kissed during a lunch by the sea. After Cannes, Kelly even spent a few days with Aumont's family near Paris and met his daughter. But at the end of the month of May, when the actress was back in the States, she declared to reporters that Jean-Pierre was just a friend and she didn't have any plans to marry. Compare with the pictures of Kelly and Aumont, the first meeting with Vernier in Monaco seemed just a journalistic stunt. So how did that short and contrived meeting become something more? Grace, ever polite, wrote Ranier a thank you note a few days after their encounter. Of course, the prince answered to tell her that it had been his pleasure to meet her. And he had really been a pleasure as well as a surprise. Instead of a typical Hollywood starlet, he had met a young woman of luminous natural beauty, intelligent, gentle, kind and reserved. He was charmed. Kelly answered back. She had expected a stuffy and pretentious old monarch with little knowledge of English, so she had been struck by his youth, the perfect command of the language, the European sophistication she had already appreciated in Milan, Cassini and Aumont and the romance of meeting a real prince. From this back and forth flowed an old-fashioned courtship. During seven months of letter writing, to their mutual surprise, they discovered that they were similar in many ways. They both had a childhood marred by little love and much loneliness and an inherent lo difference from people around them. Grace loved theatre and acting in a family of competitive sports people, while Ranier had been nominated heir to a throne by passing his mother and elder sister. Both the actress and the prince had to perform public duties they dislike in name of a job they love. Grace had just recently stopped being a private citizen and become a world-famous movie star, while Ranier had had to contend with that all his life. And both had a deep Catholic faith, and they really wanted a family. Kelly and Grimaldi shared their past, their present, and what they wanted for their future, and the type of person they wanted to share that future with. As they slowly opened their heart to each other, the friendship deepened into something more, and they discovered it was mutual. As the actors remembered, I was especially impressed with Vernier's long view of things. He saw the larger picture, the context. We found we had a lot in common, and we had the same needs and hopes for our future. I was dissatisfied with my life, and he with his. For two shy people with busy and very public professional lives, in a time when air travel was arduous and smartphones didn't exist, a written courtship had the advantage of being intimate and discreet and easy to fit in a hectic schedule. Ranier wanted to marry for love, but as he explained, my greatest difficulty is knowing a girl long enough and intimately enough to find out if we are really soulmates as well as lovers. In the fall of 1955, 
During a magazine interview, Rainier talked about his upcoming trip to America. It would be his first, and he wanted to visit Florida to fish, and maybe California. Asked if there was anyone in particular he wanted to encounter, Rainier answered, Yes, that young actress I met in Monaco. Her name is Grace Kelly. I'd like to meet her again. A photo session was organized on the set of the romantic comedy The Swan that Grace was filming in a huge mansion in North Carolina. That movie is now remembered mainly because of the similarities with her real life, since Kelly interprets Alexandra, a princess from a minor branch of European royals. Unfortunately, the production was running late, and the photo shoot with Fernier was cancelled. The actress and the monarch secretly planned to meet at Christmas. Rainier came to Philadelphia carrying a gift he had especially made for Grace. A gift that could be contained in a small jewelry box. He had sailed to America reasonably sure of the welcome he would get from the actress, but convincing her family might be a totally different affair. Accompanying the monarch in his faithful journey were his spiritual advisor, Father Tucker, who had supported and helped the pair from the beginning, and his personal doctor, Dr. Donat, ostensibly there to accompany him at a checkup at the John Hopkins University Hospital in Baltimore, which is about 100 miles or 150 kilometers from Philadelphia. At the time, medical checkups in the U.S. were all the rage among wealthy Europeans. The prince arrived at the Kelly's home on the late afternoon of Christmas Day, along with Father Tucker and Dr. Donat. Rainier and Grace finally saw each other again for the first time in seven months. Those months of distance and the open curiosity of her family made them self-conscious and nervous. But as soon as they started chatting, they forgot the existence of anyone else. As Jack Kelly remembered, they both went round with stars in their eyes. It was the first time for Grace that her family warmly welcomed one of her suitors. Around 10 p.m., Father Tucker announced he had to catch a train to Wilmington, Maryland, where he was staying uh, with an old friend. Rainier seemed reluctant to leave, and Grace's parents, sensing that something was up, decided to intervene. Mr. Kelly drove Father Tucker to the station, while Mrs. Kelly offered the prince and the doctor a place to sleep for the night. Around 11 p.m., Peggy invited her sister, Rainier, and the doctor back to her house to end the evening. They stayed up until 3 a.m. playing cards. Well, at least Peggy and Dr. Donat played cards, while Rainier and Grace kept talking and talking. The next day was beautifully sunny, so the actors took the monarch for a day trip in the countryside and to visit her favorite places in Philadelphia. That evening, Jack noticed a ring on the fourth finger of his daughter's left hand and wanted to know if it was an engagement ring, but Grace demurred. According to her, it was only a friendship ring, made with two rows of rubies and diamonds, like the red and white flag of Monaco. The official version of the proposal is that on New Year's Eve, at a friend's private party in New York, Rainier asked, Will you marry me? And Grace answered, Yes. Before announcing the happy news to the world, there were many personal and legal arrangements to attend to. Kelly wanted to reveal that she was going to get married, to her friends and ex-lovers before they read it on the newspapers. The two fiancés also had to sign a contract of marriage. According to this contract, 
anything each spouse brought to a union continued to be his or her own. In case of divorce, any child they would have would stay with the father because he or she would be a potential heir to the throne and a substantial dowry would need to be paid to the prince before the marriage. There were also rumors that Ranier asked for a fertility test to be performed on Grace, but as the ruler of Monaco could legally adopt an heir, it wasn't necessary for a princess to be able to carry children. Grace's families and friends were surprised and a little dismayed at the requests, but she accepted them and wanted to be done with them as soon as possible, while her father put up some resistance, especially at the idea of having to pay someone to marry his daughter. The actress wasn't worried about what would happen in case of divorce, because as a Catholic, she expected to stay married to Rainier until death parted them. So far, Grace had gone against exceptional odds to make a success in her professional life. She presumed it would be the same in her personal life. She would give it her all and she would triumph. For a new partnership to start, another needed to be closed. Kelly had to explain to MGM that she would not complete her contract with them. The studio executives accepted to release her in exchange for the authorization to film a documentary about her ceremony, bombastically called The Wedding of the Century. They also gave her 65,000 yearly bonus, that's around $620,000 or about 530,000 uh, euros today. They also continued to pay her a weekly stipend for months after she had become the Princess of Monaco. And for the ceremony, not only they gifted her one of the most beautiful and memorable wedding dresses of the 20th century, they also provided a studio hairdresser and an expert public relations specialist to accompany the actress to Monaco. Grace was now legally bound to Rainier and to no one and nothing else. So on January the 5th, 1956, the Monegas government and Jack Kelly officially announced the marriage of Miss Grace Patricia Kelly and His Serene Highness Rainier III of Monaco. The news were so sudden and unexpected that during the first official interview of the happy couple, immediately following the announcement, the question came up if it was a marriage of convenience, along with many other intrusive inquiries. Grace was glowing in a champagne shirt dress with polka dots. On her left hand, she proudly displayed the ring for the photographers and the cameramen. I've been in love before, but never in love like this, she proclaimed. The prince was slightly be bewildered in a blue suit and tie with the emblem of the Légion d'honneur on his lapel, but he showed clear ideas on, the future li on their future life. I think it would be better if she did not attempt to continue in films, Ranier said quietly but firmly. I have to live there in Monaco, and she will live there. That wouldn't work out. As for movies in Europe, I don't think so. She will have enough to do as princess, but she will not be involved in the administration of Monaco. After another intrusive questions about having a big family, Ranier decided to cut short the interview. After all, I don't belong to MGM, he commented to his spiritual advisor. The next day, the announcement was front page news worldwide. Le dernier de Grimaldi, the last of Grimaldi, as he was called in France, was finally getting married. Opinions began pouring in, from the ecstatic to the disbelieving to the disapproving. Grace had a public image of such aloofness 
that it was hard for the public to imagine her as someone who weds for love, someone she had met twice. Even her family and friends, who knew the real Gracie, the passionate, impulsive romantic who fell in love all the time, had trouble believing it. Ranier clarified later in an interview, It's very hard to explain, but it was something we both felt intensely. We knew we could make our lives together, and that now was the time to do it. We weren't children. We had both been through hard experiences and had learned from them what we were really looking for in marriage. That's what decided us to go ahead. It wasn't irrational. It was very thought out, but it was also very romantic. Kelly reiterated the sentiment when she said, There are many people I could love. I think it depends on the man you want to devote yourself to spend your life with. This is the decision of marriage. The 5th of January was the start of an obsession with Grace and Rainier. According to her mother, one of the reasons was that, in a way, her story is an affirmation of the American dream. If Gracie can marry a prince, every American girl can. Which is true, although, again, her mother seems to ignore all her daughter's professional and personal accomplishments. In mid-January, Grace went to Hollywood to start filming her last movie, the lovely musical comedy High Society. And you can see her wearing a second and very sparkly engagement ring by Cartier. It's a beautiful and sizable 10.47 carat emerald cut diamond flanked by two baguette diamonds mounted in platinum. In California, Kelly was soon joined by Rainier and his father, Duke Pierre de Polignac, who had arrived from Paris to meet his almost daughter-in-law. Father and son rented a villa near the actress, and Grace and the Duke got along famously in the little time off she had from set. Ranier and Pierre returned to Europe in February, while Kelly continued working until the beginning of March and enjoying every minute of it, despite the stress of having to prepare for one of the most anticipated events of the year, if not the decade and having to move to another continent. Grace had only a few weeks to go to the dress fittings for her wedding dress, to buy everything she possibly needed for her trousseau, to talk to the many reporters and to pose for the many photographers who hounded her, to close her home in New York and to attend the four bridal showers thrown for her. On the 4th of April, 1956, Grace left on the SS Constitution from Manhattan and meet cheering crowds. On board with the actors, there were 78 relatives, friends and business associates. Her black French poodle Oliver, four trunks, 56 other pieces of luggages, 20 hat boxes and one metal trunk containing her gorgeous wedding dress. The luggage was packed with exquisite designer gowns, smart day dresses, expensive furs, slick suits, handmade low heel pumps, an armful of old shirts, old blouses, old jeans and old shoes. The friend who helped her pack while sipping champagne was horrified at the idea of Grace bringing these worn out fade clothes to one of the chicest places in Europe. But Kelly was unfazed. She replied that she expected to wear them most of the time. As the ship sailed into the fog, Grace wondered what the future held. In the second part of Grace and Ranier, we will follow Grace in her transatlantic trip to Monaco and see what princely weddings are like. Yes, there will be more than one wedding. Thank you for listening. And join me next time for part two.